leave a like before we get started. Thank you, let's begin. I just had a two-year relationship blow up in my face, and I didn't know how to react or feel about it. I had concluded a business meeting and was about to leave the restaurant when I spotted my girlfriend eating on the other side. I got excited and went over to talk to her for a brief moment. Going back to the office, I walked up to her table with a smile on my face like I was a freaking clown, only for me to get there and find her with another guy. I tried to talk to her, but the guy didn't let me speak. Things got confrontational, and I walked out of that restaurant with my heart shattered in my hands and my feelings scattered all over the place. I felt numb and alone as I slowly made my way to the car. I got to the parking lot and put the keys into the ignition, only to cry in the car before driving away. I didn't think I was the one to cry over a relationship, but it was happening right now, and I couldn't stop it. I got myself together and drove back to the office, parked my car in the office parking lot, and adjusted my composure before stepping out of the vehicle. My eyes were still slightly swollen. Everything looked awful in the mirror, and I'll be honest, I didn't even feel like going anywhere. I submitted the assignment contracts to the higher-ups and left for my office. I only stayed briefly before leaving and then heading home. My emotions were running wild, and the office was the last place I wanted to be. I had just landed a big contract for the company, so nobody would complain if I left to celebrate early. I got home and headed straight to the kitchen. I pulled a glass out of the cabinet and grabbed a bottle of whiskey before shuffling into the living room. I pulled myself a glass, gulped the whole thing down, and ran another. I did the same over and over. Eventually, I passed out, and I woke up after two hours. A banging headache and blurry vision greeted me from all the liquor I had just consumed. I got up and staggered to the bathroom and looked at myself in the mirror before vomiting into the toilet. I cleaned myself up and took a long bath before coming out with new energy and a steeled resolve. I didn't like working. I really hated it. But having to see my own girlfriend cheat on me while at work? That's a whole another level of depression. I picked up my phone and logged back into my old Tinder account. The last time I used the app was two years ago. I blocked Emily on everything I had her on. I didn't want to see her face ever again. And quite frankly, she clearly had a better guy than me. I still knew my way around Tinder. I'd been using it since I was a teenager. I swiped right on five different women. Three of them eventually texted me back a few days later. I didn't even take the time to get to know any of them before just fixing a date. I guess you could call it a revenge date. They weren't anything special, but I still found them moderately attractive. I returned to the office later that day like nothing happened. I greeted everyone like I usually did and finished the work on my desk before going home to prepare for my first date. I got home and showered before changing into some fancy clothes. I combed my hair into style before grabbing my phone and keys and heading out. I drove to the restaurant and met with her. We got something to eat and she began the conversation by talking about her pet. I wasn't even interested in getting to know her or getting into a relationship with her. I was only interested in using her for a one-night stand. She was simply the first lady I was going out with, the first match on the app. We finished eating, and I started feeling a little dizzy. I thought it would go away with time, but it only got worse as we talked. I think she noticed it and offered me to get some water. She left the table and returned with a bottle of water. I drank the whole thing and the dizziness immediately became worse. She started telling people that I was her boyfriend and I was having an allergic reaction.
I tried to talk and defend myself, but my mouth felt numb, and it felt like my throat was closing. I could barely swallow. On top of this, my brain was too slow to make any rational decisions at the moment. I watched helplessly as people carried me into her car, and she began driving away from the restaurant. I remember some of the staff trying to stop her, saying that they needed to contact an ambulance. She went on about that this was normal for me. I just needed to get back and have my medication. I knew I was in deep, but for those few moments, my body was paralyzed, and I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't bring myself to fight back or do anything. I could barely move. My entire body felt limp on the car seat as I watched the road blur past us. I managed to regain a bit of my consciousness and began struggling for the steering wheel with her. I tried to stop her, but the car veered off the road. I felt shooting pain on my head and shoulders with each impact from the vehicle hitting trees and random buildings of people's property. We must have been going at least 70 miles per hour along a suburban street. The sound of glass was shattering everywhere, filling the air with each impact as the car just kept smashing into things. The smell of metal, iron, and even blood filled my nose as my mind finally shut down and everything faded to black. I didn't know how long I was passed out in the car, but my mind was filled with terror and fear as I opened my eyes and found that she wasn't in the car with me. I immediately began struggling to get out of the car, but my leg was stuck on something and I couldn't seem to get it out. My body was weak from the gashing wound on my left arm and whatever she had put in my food or drink. But the adrenaline I was feeling was doing an excellent job at numbing the pain. I finally got my foot out of the piece of metal holding it by taking my shoe off. I climbed out of the car through the shattered window and fell flat on the hard floor. My breathing labored as I lay there helplessly on the floor. I closed my eyes and breathed fresh air before opening them to find a way out. I stood up and turned around to see a massive chunk of sticks flying in my direction. I ducked down, and the sticks landed on the misshaped, mangled car, creating a fresh dent and banging sound. I looked up and saw my date in torn apart clothes and dry blood on her hair. I could see the wound on her forehead but she didn't seem to care about that. Her eyes were unfocused and staring blankly at me. I watched in confusion as she reached down and grabbed another log of wood. She started sprinting towards me like a savage in one of those Amazon villages. I managed to avoid her swing at the stick and tackled her to the ground. She was pathetic and pretty weak. And even with all the injuries, and even the sedation I'd been given. I could still overcome her strength. I punched her square in the face and tried to get up to leave. I could tell from the look in her eyes that she didn't have any strength left to fight. And quite frankly, neither did I. I was about to leave when she began laughing like a maniac while lying on the floor. I turned around and saw the same look I had when I found my girlfriend cheating on me in her eyes. You're all the same, every last one of you, she chuckled, her laughter echoing with sadness and pain throughout the whole neighborhood. I wanted to find a way out of this place alone, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I returned to the car and searched the wreckage for any signs of my phone or hers. I finally found mine in the back seat, but I couldn't reach it from any side of the car unless I wanted to tear up my arm to get it. I went back and found a huge stick. I pulled the phone closer to the window before grabbing it with my hand. I could feel my eyes shutting from all the blood I'd lost in the crash. 
I managed to call for help before dropping down on my ass, my lungs struggling to take in oxygen as I waited for help to arrive. For some weird reason, none of the neighbors or residents in this area had so much as come out to see if we were okay. I don't know if they thought it was some kind of gang fight or if they were going to be in danger by coming out. There's no way they didn't hear the sounds of the car colliding with objects. The adrenaline rush I was feeling either had faded away or I was just starting to pass out and lose consciousness. The pain in my left arm was now tearing me apart and I managed to stay awake and dip in and out of consciousness for long enough until help arrived and pulled us out of this nightmare. Eventually, I did pass out, but I do remember some memories. A couple of ambulances, EMTs, and even some other people that were helping along the roadside. The doctor checked my vital stats and gave me a prescription for sedatives. He told me to rest while they worked on the wound and flushed my system. It was a good idea because I felt like death warmed over. The doctor said that I had severe blood loss and they advised me to stay put and not stress myself until they could fix my hand properly. They bandaged my arm, giving it a cast so it wouldn't hurt later. The doctor told me that the police would need my statement and that after all this, I was to have a drip in my arm to flush out some of the sedatives. Overall, this lady was a loony. I think she was even sectioned and put in a mental asylum. They did a review of her, and guess what? Nothing ever happened. It all came to the fact that she was insane. And after being put on year on year off, she constantly was being monitored. After this, she turned up at my house a few times, until eventually, the cops and the people doing the therapy. Brutality of the assault. The onlookers at the beach were gathering, creating a circle around the chaotic scene, but no one dared to intervene. I felt a mix of panic and helplessness as I watched the violent confrontation unfold before my eyes. The initial excitement of exploring romantic possibilities had transformed into a nightmare, with the two men fighting for reasons that eluded me. The beach, once a serene backdrop for a potential romantic evening, now bore witness to a brawl fueled by jealousy and rage. I knew I had to do something, but fear held me in place. As the struggle between Tim and Simon intensified, I mustered the courage to approach them. Stop! Please stop! I shouted, my voice trembling. The onlookers were now murmuring among themselves, their eyes fixated on the escalating violence. It seemed like an eternity before Tim and Simon separated, both panting heavily, faces bruised and bloodied. The anger in their eyes was undiminished, and I could sense the tension in the air. Enough, I pleaded, tears welling up in my eyes. This is insane. What are you both doing? Tim, still seething with anger, shot a glare at Simon. You stay away from her. She's with me. Simon, wiping blood from his face, retorted. You don't own her, man. If she wants to be with me, that's her choice. The crowd continued to murmur, unsure of what to make of the situation. I felt the weight of their judgment as the focus of this bizarre spectacle. In that moment, I knew I had to make a decision. The chaos on the beach mirrored the tumult within me. I took a step back, distancing myself from the violence and the chaos that had erupted from my attempt to explore the realm of romantic possibilities. I can't believe this, I muttered to myself, realizing the gravity of the situation this was a mistake. The beach, once a potential canvas for a budding connection, 
now bore witness to the shattered fragments of my ill-fated experiment. The journey into the world of dating apps had veered into an unexpected territory, leaving scars on the sand and wounds in my heart. As I turned away from the tumultuous scene, the beach, with its crashing waves and setting sun, became a poignant backdrop to a moment of self-reflection. I had sought something meaningful, but found myself entangled in a web of chaos. It was time to step back, reassess my desires, and navigate the complexities of relationships with a newfound understanding. In the fading light, I walked away from the beach, leaving behind the echoes of the confrontation. The lessons learned on that turbulent evening would shape my journey as I moved forward. Acknowledging the importance of genuine connections and the perils of navigating the unpredictable landscape of romance, doorbell rang and my heart skipped a beat with anticipation. I took a deep breath and walked to the door, opening it to reveal John standing there with a smile on his face. He looked somewhat different from his pictures on Tinder, but not in a bad way. There was a certain charm to him that didn't quite translate through photos. We exchanged greetings, and he handed me a bouquet of flowers, a sweet and unexpected gesture. As we sat in the living room, conversation flowed easily. John had a warm personality, and we shared laughs over common interests. The initial nervousness began to fade, and I found myself enjoying the company. We decided to go to a nearby cafe for dinner, opting for a casual setting to continue our conversation. The evening unfolded pleasantly, with discussions ranging from our hobbies to our favorite books. The connection felt genuine, and I appreciated the fact that we could communicate effortlessly. After dinner, we took a stroll in a nearby park, enjoying the serenity of the evening. The conversation delved into deeper topics, and I felt a sense of comfort being with John. It was a stark contrast to the chaotic events of my previous dating experiences. As the night progressed, I realized that sometimes patience pays off. The months of getting to know John through messages and calls had laid a foundation for a connection that extended beyond physical appearances. It was refreshing to be with someone who seemed genuinely interested in understanding me, and I reciprocated the sentiment. Days turned into weeks, and John and I continued to spend time together. We explored new places, shared experiences, and navigated the complexities of getting to know someone on a deeper level. The initial skepticism I had about online dating began to wane, replaced by a newfound appreciation for the potential connections it could foster. However, life has a way of throwing unexpected twists. As our relationship developed, we faced challenges and differences that tested our compatibility. The initial excitement gave way to moments of reflection and introspection. In the end, while John and I may not have embarked on a fairy tale romance, the journey taught me valuable lessons about patience, communication, and the unpredictability of relationships. It was a chapter in my life filled with both highs and lows, and I emerged with a greater understanding of what I sought in a partner. As the anticipation of meeting someone for the first time turned into the intricacies of navigating a relationship, I realized that every experience, whether smooth or tumultuous, contributes to personal growth. And so, the journey of dating continued, with each encounter shaping my understanding of love, connection, and the intricate dance of two souls trying to find harmony in the vast landscape of relationships. I would say he was white and had a medium build. His hair was short, and he looked like he was in his late 20s to early 30s. 
He had a scruffy beard which suited him well, and his eyes were brown. I've always found brown eyes to be boring, but for some reason, when I looked into his eyes, it was like I was looking into a different universe. I remember getting lost for a split second before he spoke and snapped me out of my trance. We started walking down this dark and windy path that I assume was used by the locals to reach a popular viewpoint. I asked him where we were going, and he just said it's a surprise. I didn't want to ruin the night by being grumpy, so I decided to play along. The path we were walking down got darker and more narrow as we continued. I could barely see a thing, but John seemed to know exactly where he was going. It was like he'd been here a thousand times before. We finally reached the clearing, and to my surprise, it was a small beach surrounded by cliffs. It was beautiful, and the moonlight reflecting off the water made it even more enchanting. John set up a blanket on the sand and started arranging the food he bought. It looked like a feast fit for a king, or in this case, fit for two very hungry adults. We sat down and started eating, talking about random things as we enjoyed the food. Surprisingly, the initial awkwardness began to fade away, and we found ourselves laughing and sharing stories. It was turning out to be a decent night, despite the rocky start. After finishing our feast, John suggested we take a walk along the shore. I agreed, and we strolled along the beach barefoot. The sand was cool, and the sound of the waves crashing against the shore created a soothing atmosphere. It was during this walk that I started to see a different side of John. He opened up about his life, his dreams, and even shared some personal struggles. I appreciated his honesty and vulnerability. It made him more real to me. As we walked further down the beach, we found a spot to sit and just enjoy the sound of the waves. It was a peaceful moment, and for the first time that night, I felt a genuine connection with John. We talked about our past relationships and what we were looking for in a partner. Surprisingly, our values and expectations aligned. We laughed about our failed attempts at love and bonded over the realization that finding the right person can be a journey filled with ups and downs. The night went on, and before we knew it, it was well past midnight. We decided to head back to the car, and as we drove home, I couldn't help but feel a sense of contentment despite the rocky start. John walked me to my door, and we said our goodbyes. He asked if he could see me again, and I agreed. We exchanged numbers, and he left with a smile on his face. As I closed the door behind me, I reflected on the night. It taught me that sometimes first impressions can be deceiving, and that giving someone a chance to open up can lead to unexpected connections. Despite the initial hiccups, John and I continued to see each other, and our relationship evolved into something meaningful. That night on the beach became a pivotal moment in our journey together, and a reminder that love often unfolds in the most unexpected places. Certainly, here's your text with added commas and some paragraph breaks. Before he realized it, John tripped over his own feet and nearly fell off the cliff. I screamed and rushed forward, grabbing his arm just in the nick of time. It was a terrifying moment that sobered us both up quickly. John realized how close he had come to a serious accident and apologized for his reckless behavior. We decided to pack up and head back down the cliff to a safer location. Once we reached the bottom, we found a more stable spot to finish our meal and enjoy the rest of the evening. The night had taken an unexpected turn, but we shared a few laughs and bonded over the adrenaline rush. John admitted that he sometimes made impulsive decisions and was grateful that I was there to prevent a disaster. 
Despite the chaotic start, the date turned into a memorable adventure and showed me a different side of John. We both agreed to plan our next outing with more caution and choose activities that didn't involve cliffs or alcohol. Our subsequent dates were less eventful, but filled with genuine connection and understanding. John eventually stopped trying to impress me with surprises and focused on building a meaningful connection. We continued to see each other, and our relationship grew stronger as we navigated the ups and downs of life together. That night on the cliff became a pivotal moment in our story, a reminder that sometimes the unexpected can lead to a deeper connection, and that a genuine connection is worth exploring, even if it comes with a few unexpected challenges. Being here on the sixth or seventh date was surreal. At this point, John slipped, fell, and tripped over the cliff's edge. It might be hard for you to believe, but try being there, witnessing it in person. I was 15 to 20 meters away from the cliff edge, lying down on the picnic blanket, trying to fight the wind and prevent it from blowing all our stuff away. Suddenly, John, who was dancing and stumbling all over the place in the early stages of being completely drunk, fell off the edge of the cliff. I didn't even hear his scream or cry. The second my brain registered what I had just seen, the sugar crash in my blood from all the chocolates and the spike in my insulin had plummeted my blood sugars. We had already eaten for the past 40 minutes. I was starting to get drowsy, but my mind kicked into action. I leaped up, and in doing so, the wind blew away the blanket, half the food, and one of the completely empty bags. I didn't give a damn. I was mortified at what I had just witnessed and could barely control my own legs. I wanted to see but I was too scared to go close to the edge. In that split moment, I thought maybe the wind had pushed John off the edge, but he was 6'2", and a bit hefty. It didn't make any sense. I got closer and closer, till eventually I decided to crawl the last five meters to avoid the chances of being blown off. When I got to the edge, I poked my eyes over the cliff edge I was met with the sight of John. His body mangled at the bottom of this approximately 200 meter drop. There were rocks, boulders, heather, and bushes. He wasn't moving, and he wasn't making a single noise at all. I called 911, and a random mountain rescue team came out along with around 10 units of police, on top of ambulances and even a helicopter. It seemed like we had the whole state of Arizona's medical emergency services. Eventually, I realized that he was dead. They didn't even bother trying CPR. Apparently, the guy's spine broke in two separate places. He was drunk and intoxicated. They did a test and a post-mortem on his body. I can't believe I witnessed someone fall to their death. I didn't even hear him yell, cry, or shout for help. I guess that's what alcohol can do. Of all the Tinder dates I've been on, and dates in general, nothing exciting ever happened. This was going along as the best one yet, until the guy literally stumbled off the cliff and died. I did warn him, but that doesn't matter. The damn guy died. He lost his life because he brought beer to a date that I didn't even want. I feel sad. I didn't go to his funeral although the family did invite me. I don't feel like I really helped. It was my duty to call the emergency services. I wouldn't just turn around and leave him there. Thank you to everyone for the advice and helping me. I couldn't climb down a cliff edge and save the guy. I don't even know how to do CPR. And for three minutes, I couldn't even get a phone signal. So please guys, for those of you commenting, saying I didn't do enough. Go and be in this situation yourself. Then come back to me and type your story. 
You'd probably die of a panic attack if you witnessed this. Or you'd start crying for days on end in your own bed. Years on, and I finally realized how precious life is. Humans are pretty easy to kill. Not just by other humans. But nature doing it. Animals doing it. Disease, infection, and microbes. I really cherish life after witnessing him. I witnessed that event, and it'll stay with me for a long time. I don't think I'll ever forget it. The longest I've gone without properly thinking about it has to have been around a week or two. That's it. It's an ingrained memory, like a default thought that always comes back if I have nothing else to think of. There's no way I could have saved him. People say that maybe I could have stopped him from stumbling near the edge, but I wasn't about to pull him away and put myself in danger. To some people, that actually sounds selfish. I'm sorry, but I feel I did what I did. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening to today's video. If you enjoyed these stories, please support the channel by subscribing, liking the video, and sharing my videos. If you can, please share this video with your friends, family, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, any forums that you have, or group chats that might be interested. I'm really trying to grow my channel. All my stories are original, unheard of ever on YouTube, and I think I'm the most often and common posting channel. Thank you guys, and I'll catch you in tomorrow's upload.